All right, I, I, it's 12 o'clock. I will start by introducing Paul Lucas. Is that pronounced correctly? In the United States, it's Lucas. Um, and as you know, it's other places, it's Lukash. Lukash, okay. <laughs> All, right. All right. Paul Lucas, FAIA lead AP, is a practicing architect who has been a BSA member since 1988. He manages Paul Lucas Architecture, PLA close to Davis Square in Somerville. And he also just founded PLASES, an arm of PLA that focuses exclusively on sustainable design. They are hiring, just in case anybody's interested. Mm -hmm. um, he attended Miami University as an undergraduate and MIT as a graduate. He has taught for nearly 20 years locally and abroad. I've just learned he's also a jury member in a, a, a large conference in China at the end of this year. He's also the author of Suburban Transformations, which explores strategies for making suburbs more sustainable over time. Paul, surprisingly, is a, a rabid soccer fan. <laughs> Ajax <laughs> Amsterdam is his favorite team. Well, go, go team. And with <laughs> that, I hand over to you, Paul. Thank you okay. very much for coming. Okay, hoop Ajax. All right. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, it's good to be part of this, and thank you, um, Peter Nestor, for your kind invitation to speak to the BSA Sustainability Committee. Your invitation came just after we launched our new website, which we've been working hard on uh, this past pandemic uh, year. Um, putting the website together was an opportunity for us to reflect on the over 30 sustainable. Um, sustainable projects we've been involved in over the last 15 years. Wow. Um, and many of those are in master planning types, as you'll see. So what I'd like to do today is not show you all those 30 projects, but talk about four of these. Two of them are in China and two are in Boston area. Thus the title, Sustainable Excursions from Boston to China and Back. Okay. The first project um, that I'm going to talk about is called the Jindu Sustainable Pavilion. The developer is the Jindu Development Company, and they're based out of Hangzhou, China. The building is part showroom, part meeting place, uh, has a gym, and has a recreational conference space. But more importantly, it reflects the developer's interest in creating a 50,000 square foot demonstration sustainable building that is part of a 1,000 unit housing complex that the developer developed. Um, that what they wanted to do was share with um, the larger community and the residents, the developers keen interest in all things sustainable. The first two projects, by the way, were done in partnership with Brooks Mostu and Zhui Zan under the moniker of the China Vision Project. Brooks is an old friend of mine. Um, he joined me when I was going to China on a number of these projects. And I got to know Zhui, who was an effective partner with us <clears throat> Um, who's shown here in the far right, uh, having worked with her husband, Jian Zhang, um, and who had worked with us in one summer in the office while he was at the GSD. Um, and also you can see here is uh, Harada-san. He's a local Japanese landscape architect and Kathy, who is Jue's sister. But before starting the design, um, what we, what the clients, uh, before we start our design, the client and the academic friends that we've got to know while we're in China generously offered to tour us uh, and take us to some of the historic water towns and cities close to Hangzhou. Now, one of my favorite sites was the town of Hongsun in Anhui province. Hongsun was named as a UNESCO heritage site in the year 2000. It's a great example of vernacular sustainable practices which are carried out in the design of this beautiful village. Here you can see the approach to the town over a bridge spanning a small lake. The town is north of uh, this lake and the mountains, Sashan, are to the north of the town. So what the mountains do is they protect the town from the cold northern winds. Uh, so but the northern mountains to the north are also shedding water to the south 
that is rivers, streams, and canals weave their way through the densely packed village and supply a city with all of its water needs. The water is then finally filtered by tall grasses and plantings in the lake to the south of the town. As you'll see, there is a beautifully calibrated balance between building, open space, and landscape. And the public spaces uh, are often filled with water, as in this image of this plaza-like lake right in the middle of the town. While heavily touristed now, the town also shows how sustainability and beauty take on a new dimension. And here are some examples of how flowing water is used throughout the town. Note noteworthy are some of the simple, elegant black slabs um, that become bridges crossing waterways as they cut through the townscape. Besides defining a private entrance to each house, the black stone also serves a utilitarian purpose. The bridges and seats are used to dry vegetables, even laundry, especially effective on those hot days because the stone, of course, is black and gets hotter. Um, many of the courtyard houses also have their own courtyard pools where, they can, where people can raise fish. So all of these examples and so many other places like Hongsung that we went to visit fed our imagination and they provided us with a cultural appreciation of what, our, what our client wanted to achieve. That is to design a model for sustainable and healthy living in the design of this one building. Now, our site was located in Hangzhou, China. Now, Hangzhou is a medium-sized city in China with some 10 million people. I know it's crazy, um, but it's also famous for its spectacular and beautiful Xihu uh, Lake or West Lake. Um, our site is about two kilometers north of this beautiful lake. Now, the actual site was part of a larger university campus, which was being demolished as we were visiting there one day. And as you can see, there are no OSHA concerns here. Um, but you can also see these roof tiles that are off to this. Oops. We were one second, something came out of sequence. You can also see roof tiles and other materials that were being saved for recycling. And that's in fact what we propose as part of our design to reuse some of the tiles for the building elevation. And you'll see that shortly. So what's unique about this project is that our clients were really keen on knowing everything they could about sustainable design. So they asked us to prepare these research documents. So what we did before starting the design, we spent about six weeks in Boston with a group of academics and we created this 300 page document, which highlighted some of the more recent developments of sustainability at that time. And then we went back to China and we did a presentation to the Jindu executive team and their design and engineering team. And we shared with them the results of our uh, findings over the course of four, year, four days. Um, so it was kind of a compressed seminar, but what was more important, it was it created a document which served as a basis of design because what happened was each of their clients, they would tell us the things that they wanted to pursue or integrate into the package, design package or things that they would say for other days. So from there, we took um, a deep dive immediately into developing three schematics. I won't show you all three, but this is one that started spurring us in one particular direction. And this was called the pine, or the spine, I should say. Um, and it included a subterranean pool. So two stories below grade. Um, these drawings are done by Ben Graham. He's a very talented designer who worked with us, now residing in Oregon. The clients love, the, in particular, the facade studies, which are almost Alto-esque. But they wanted something that was a little less grotto-like, uh, the idea that the pool was so deep in the ground. Instead, it led to another alternative, and this is one of the sketches that was kind of a breakthrough. And what they want to do is think of the pool as being something more like a vessel, such that the pool and the water it contained are celebrated and elevated to a higher level. This was inspired in part by some of the extraordinarily elegant vessels and pottery that I saw in Xi'an at the museum there. And some of these vessels um, are, go back 5,000 plus years. Back in Hangzhou one evening, Brooks and I were working on, in the hotel late at night on sketches that pretty much defined the concepts in the diagram. Um, here are some of the sketches that describe our ideas, including elevating the pool, 
and containing the pool in this contained volume, which is the building proper. By the way, there were a lot of constraints that were defined as part of this um, project, including the building envelope. And this is a pivotal sketch, um, which shows the kind of a longitudinal section of the pool contained within the volume of the building that was allowed by the zoning and site parameters. Now to capture more space, we use subterranean spaces for meeting rooms um, and meeting spaces and support spaces, in particular mechanical spaces. So back in Boston, we refined the design in the diagram. Most of the work was done in physical model in Rhino, but this diagram calls out some of the important proposed active and passive strategies that we deployed as part of the design. Key of which was the uh, incorporating natural ventilation as much as possible. There was also this crazy idea of using some of the heating generated um, by some of the uh, factories in the local area that are then piped from one place to the other through these insulated pipes. This is something we had seen traveling throughout China on numerous occasions. So we thought maybe there's a way of capturing some unused heat from other sources in the neighborhood. Now the west wall um, used heavily vegetated wall of hanging plants, uh, but it's also used to help capture and recycle water. Uh, these hanging gardens also help shade the west interior spaces, but they also filter light through the interior spaces of the pavilion with a kind of a green hue. And here's an exploded diagram <clears throat> showing the key components of our design. Uh, please take special notice of the running track. So there's a running track for the uh, for, for, for uh, athletes, and it's suspended just beneath the pool and runs around the pool, around the perimeter of the building, the interior of the building. So as you're running, you get this very unique perspective of uh, all the indoor and outdoor spaces. Here are some more developed drawings showing lateral and um, longitudinal cross sections. And also shown here is the east elevation looking over the entry court. And so there we use special shading devices to prevent overexposure of sun. So the building definitely had a challenging siting proposition in the sense that it was really facing east and west more than north and south. And there's six major floors, two of which are shown here. The one on the left shows the, the primary living uh, floor, first floor plan. And so what happens is you, there's the brick element number one that cuts from the plaza across this kind of chasm onto a balcony that overlooks the gardens. Um, and this bridge was commonly referred to as the bridge to the future. Uh, a couple of floors up, you'll see the gym floor, partial gym floor, which overlooks the other spaces below, but also is nestled underneath the vessel-like form of the pool itself. So um, we did make some trips back and forth uh, to meet with clients about this project and others. Um, and then we had a chance to see, for the first time, a model made of the entire site. And this was the building as uh, it was developed and had finished up its uh, construction drawings. Um, and you can see it in the site. I should mention that the entry court, as you can see on the left, um, was designed by C2 Landscape um, Architects. They are now based out of Fort Collins in Colorado. Um, and what was interesting, you can also get a sense of the context. So there are some large towers, or I think six major towers of up to 28 stories in this uh, area, very kind of densely packed. Um, and then next door to us is a school and a kindergarten. And then there's on the other side, shops and office buildings. So this is very typical of the kind of Chinese development pattern found in cities like Hangzhou and others on the East Coast. Um, and now here, this is a rendering done by Alex Hograve um, shown uh, from the southeast corner of the building and looking at uh, the entry from the entry court and looking at the bridge of the future, uh, future as it reaches deeper into the space. And you can also see the profile of those two arms, those two concrete piers holding up the vessel of the form. And up above, you can see the skylight of the um, pool, which I'll be showing you shortly. Um, and here are some sections uh, perspectives showing the interior spaces um, and also it describes our process of how we work 
we do everything in three dimensions, whether it's a model or um, a digital model, and we often draw over them. Many times drawing, multiple people will draw over the same drawing in an iterative process, which can yield some very interesting results. This particular drawing was done by, again, Ben, um, and then Kajo Chen and Alex did the final rendering. But imagine uh, doing a, a backstroke uh, underneath the skylight um, and seeing the moon or stars at night. Um, so the full drama of the space was meant to be felt and experienced in this pool. And we did have this chance to see the project under construction. Um, and here I am with Chris Zarek, who was our managing director at the time, here on the left. And you can, it was a very hot day. It was over 90 degrees, but we were so pleasantly surprised to feel how cool the spaces were um, despite the heat. And that had to do with the way the section was developed and the profiles and how air circulated naturally through the space. And you can see they were just taking off the formwork from the underside of the pool. And here's another view of the gym space, which is um, on the on the west side, you can see on the right, there's where the hanging gardens would be in the, sitting on the underside of the pool. And as all of our projects, uh, you know, none of these projects would be possible without the partnership and collaboration of many people, um, incredibly talented team on this and the other projects that I'll be showing you. So that's our first project, the Jindu Pavilion. And I wanna show you the second project in China. This came a couple years later. So that first one started 2008 till about 2011. And this one came about two, three years after that. Um, and this is in Xiamen. It's a different city on a site that had yet to be created. And the purpose of this project was to develop a master plan. So it's less about architecture, but a master plan uh, for a project that's on reclaimed land in the Bay of Xiamen in Fujian province. But it's also an opportunity to explore architectural ideas in particular as they relate to sustainable strategies. Um, again, our client had a love for all things sustainable. The project includes uh, 11 towers and the program includes housing, hotel, and mixed use. So Xiamen is a remarkable island city in Southern Taiwan, I'm sorry, Southern China, right across the bay from Taiwan. It's a historic city of some 4 million people. Uh, and the, the city was supposed to have been visited as legend has it by Marco Polo. The larger bay is populated with a number of islands. And as the islands and city run out of space to grow, land is being reclaimed along the edges of the bay, a lot like Boston was in 100, 200 years ago. Our site is on the northern side of the city island and is, on, is gonna be on reclaimed land. Now, Xiamen is in the province of Fujian and Fujian is famous for the Hakka people. And they create these incredibly impressive Tulu structures, as you can see on the left. They come in square and cylindrical uh, circular forms. Um, and they house families and livestock. And they re re represent, I believe, a unique communal form. Um, so for us, um, this form and the appeal of celebrating community was a strong influence in the design of our project. Um, legend has it that during the early years of the Cold War, the CIA mistook the Tulus for missile silos when they were scanning early satellite photographs of China. But we were also impressed by the beautiful natural rock formations found in the island's lush park and surrounding landscape. So some of these chiseled rock formations also were a source of inspiration for our team and for certainly for me when I got an opportunity to do some sketching. We also enjoyed spending time exploring this very special island called Gulang Yu uh, in Xiamen Bay. So you see the main city is Xiamen in the background and the foreground is a smaller island of Gulang Yu. This island served as an international treaty port that was managed and run by the British from 1842 to 1902. Its architecture represents a unique blend of local and European influences responding to what is a very hot and humid climate, something like Savannah, Georgia. Now here are two examples of buildings that are typical of Gulang Yu's um, architecture and they're wrapped generously by, by generously proportioned porches that are typical uh, of the region. These in-between spaces offered by the porches help temper the impact of the hot and humid climate 
that the res residents experience during the summer and other months. In addition, the island's lush vegetation provides lots of shade while catching cool ocean breezes. So what we try to do is incorporate this idea in our own design of the tower's building envelope. A porch-like screen made of solar panels helps to shade residents' gardens and balconies. In addition, the balconies have integrated operable vents in the floors, uh, allowing air to move up the entire facade. So air is, is cooled and filtered by vegetated balconies moved through these layers from floor to floor. Um, the living spaces also have another layer of operable shading devices to control light and heat. We also explored ideas for integrating wind turbines at the outer corners of the building. Um, and then we explored ways of sculpting the floor plate using their thin profiles to redirect air so that optimizes the performance of the wind turbines, but also is great for cooling and dissipating heat, much in the way heat is dissipated from an engine block on a motorcycle engine. So as you can see, ideas about generating natural and cooling became a major driver in the design. These diagrams, the lower right one in particular, show how the tubular system of spaces and ventilation corridors can direct and redirect cooling, cooled air from the base of the building throughout the tower. Now here's a section of the tower, the base of the building, the podium if you want to call it that, and the C out to the right. And it illustrates how cooling can be promoted in this structure. So sea breezes come off of the ocean, they are captured and then further cooled under the shared shaded spaces of the base building and the podium. And then air is funneled up through the skins of the tower itself. And these sections illustrate then how this concept was further developed throughout design development, which is as far as we could take the project before passing it on to the local design institute. Um, so we also wanted to develop profiles of towers that worked well in capturing sun and light while optimizing building volume. Um, these profiles were developed by Masood uh, Akbarzadeh, who now teaches at UPenn. So Masood was studying the forms of uh, these towers and figuring out how we could integrate turbines in either a central location or more on the perimeter on the wings of the tower, as it were, and manipulating the forms and skin of the building so it optimized the performance of the turbines. And so the individual tower types then were deployed on site models. Um, and the bottom one, as you can see, is probably closest to the, the final design. And it shows the water on the foreground, a plaza separating the two parts of the development and the towers um, on either side. Now this model shot illustrates how several of the design concepts that we've talked about uh, come to fruition. And they include in this image of the two hotels um, anchoring the space, um, how the rock formations that inspired sort of the massing of the building. They also show how the base buildings can take on the communal forms of the Tulu structures, not circular, but square-like. Um, and also the layered porch concept, which encourages natural ventilation. In this image and drawing, uh, you can see how the Tulu inspired courtyards at the base of the tower uh, are, are visible. And these, this drawing was done by Ji Zhao. Um, and then below that is an elevation of the 10 residential towers and two hotel towers. And here we have a close up of the towers and how they're clad in porch like building skins. And this is the final master plan um, uh, as shown on the right. And the street pattern was predetermined by the local government and planning office. And it's typical of the kind of government favored morphed grid as I refer to it. It's a pattern that you see commonly found around most Chinese cities. So we had to work very closely within the guidelines and setbacks required. So now this final plan was tested in uh, using a sunlight software package to make sure all that the living spaces received at least two hours of daylight. And fortunately, we discovered that we had passed. So that was good news. And it's pretty, pretty hair raising experience um, because you want to maximize the volume on the one hand, but make sure everybody gets sunlight. We'll finish up this project with a couple of images and renderings. This drone view, this is before drones, um, 
is uh, of two residential towers. Um, and you can see the Tulu space down at the base of the tower um, and the skin, the kind of porch-like uh, uh, in-between space of the building itself. And here are two ground level views of the Tulu courtyard to the left and then to the right, the hotel towers um, that are captured in these two, um, two renderings. And again, um, we had a remarkable team, uh, a very talented team all around working on this project. And it was a wild ride and it was done in a relatively short period of time. We thought we did in record time and our clients were always saying, what takes so long? So and I think that's typical of experience that many people have working in a fast paced environment that China presents. Now, this third project it was closer to home and this is on Columbia Point. So now we're going back to Boston. And this offer, offered us an opportunity to work on projects of the scale we did in China, while incorporating some of the lessons we learned from past projects in China and the United States. So around 2015-16, there was an international competition held um, called Living with Water. And it was announced and co-sponsored by the BSA, at the time the BRA and then USGBC. And we just couldn't resist. We felt we had to do this project. And the, Competition, uh, more globally speaking, uh, was calling for designers to address the very pressing challenges of rising sea level and climate change, the impact that uh, climate change was having on our cities. The not so distant rear view mirror was a memory of Hurricane Katrina and Sandy, both of which had caused billions of dollars of damage and environmental and societal and economic havoc. The competition used three local sites um, in Boston as a way of testing ideas to combat um, rising tides. The evidence of which is increasingly evident, especially on King Tide days on Long Wharf and other low-lying parts of Boston waterfront. So you, there are many days when you can see water lapping over Long Wharf's public space. One could argue that Boston has been living with water since its inception. There's a symbiotic relationship between water access and habitable land that's been operative for centuries. But that relationship is increasingly being threatened by climate change. Now, these are well-known evolutionary cartographies featured in Mapping Boston, a great book, The History of Boston, among other things. And they tell the story of Boston's topographic transformation. But when laid side by side with projected flooding patterns circa 2050, we can also see a strong correlation between areas that were filled more recently and um, areas that are prone to flooding in the years to come. Now, the site we selected for our research and study was on Columbia Point. Um, shown here is a map of the areas vulnerable to flooding uh, during mean tide. Um, and it's rather negligible at this time. But this map shows which areas would be flooded during a storm surge at high tide. Um, and anyone who's driven on Morsi Boulevard during a major rain event is familiar with the more modest version of this flooding pattern. Now fast forward 100 years and the entire peninsula is in danger of being flooded during a major storm surge. So given the inevitability of this foreboding danger, we sought to pursue four sets of goal. First and foremost, we wanted to protect the community and manage water as best one could within the limits of what is humanly possible. But we also wanted in the process to harness renewable energy and we wanted to create public spaces which integrated infrastructure, urbanism, landscape, and renewable systems. While we don't have time to delve deeply into all the aspects of this project, I do want to focus on a key concept, which was to cut a canal through our site. This would allow having infrastructure play a dual role, that is protecting habitable land while generating renewable energy. This idea is not a new one and was borrowed from a local source. Some 300 years ago, Mill Creek connected Mill Pond, a tidal basin with the Boston Harbor. These mills, um, along, the mills along Mill Creek were powered by the uh, changing tidal levels between Mill Creek and Mill Pond. And so our proposal is to cut a canal through the site running parallel to Morrissey Boulevard, much like Mill Creek, but at a much larger scale. So I'm gonna jump ahead here and show you the final plan that we came up with. Now on the left, you can see the existing urban fabric as it is today or more or less, and the proposed design on the right. 
using an air, urban fabric similar to the grain that is found in places like South End or Back Bay, we proposed a new block structure that extended across uh, Columbia Point while being anchored to this in the canal. Given the harbor depth and, relatively sh and how shallow it is there in that proximity, we investigated available turbine technologies, including this VLH turbine, which is, stands for very low head. And it's suitable for depths averaging about three meters. We found it in a French, uh, we found this product developed by a French company called MJ2 that fit the bill. And these French company names, they often sound like avant-garde rock groups. Um, now this slide here shows how the turbine can be anchored to concrete barrages or barrages uh, or supports at both ends of the canal. And we asked over ARP's office in New York to help make sure that there was enough velocity generated by um, the tidal flow patterns in the canal. And they did a computational fluid dynamics analysis and determined that yes, in fact, there was enough velocity that could be generated to power this uh, particular turbine. This diagram shows how the canal functions in the locations of the turbine to the north and then to the south, depending on the tidal condition. Uh, it also illustrates the capacity for containing excess water that can be generated from especially high tides or storm surges should they appear or should they uh, uh, take place. And one can also calculate the potential energy generated from the canal based on the volume of the water and its velocity. But over time, we learned that doing these calculations are very complicated and need a lot of work and verification given all the factors that are involved. But this scheme does not rely exclusively on hydropower. It is also powered by other renewable sources, including solar. So the idea is that all new housing blocks and new development um, need to include solar power in some form or another. In addition, geothermal can also provide energy where possible. Wind is also possible, but is less likely given its proximity, the site's proximity to the airport. And some of the strategies we used to make this area more resilient are based on using the full range of building and landscape typologies that are available to us as designers, whether architects or urban designers. A key typology is um, based on creating a modular urban block or what we called a building quad typology. Each block could be self-sustaining and resilient such that each block was net zero um, while managing water and flooding conditions uh, in a resilient manner. So the idea is that we can build more resilient neighborhoods and cities if we build resiliency into each block and then into each building. The size and orientation and final design of each block in this case would depend and would be built by, would be, would be built by different sets of developers and designers, generating the kind of richness and variety that one experiences in other parts of Boston, whether it's the South End, the Back Bay, or Beacon Hill, for instance. Now, another typology we deployed was the use of what we call landform typologies. These typologies are part building and part landform, but they help to add resiliency to the outer perimeters of Columbia Point. Now, it's also possible to offer a great resilience resilience and opportunities for UMass to grow in the future by using floating architecture, which can be docked to the landform typologies. This could be a metabolist dream, if you think of the Japanese movement in the 60s. The harbor can be filled with floating classrooms, offices, and other academic uses. Now, the result of deploying these typologies or other features that we have not discussed is what we hope will end up looking like a transformed neighborhood one that looks like it's very much part of Boston's evolving texture and identity, but still connected to its history and tradition. And here's a short um, animation <clears throat> showing and highlighting some of the spaces. In this case, we're looking at the canal and noticing how the, um, the courtyards open up out onto the canal. Um, and then another edge, the use of landform along the perimeter edges um, and doing everything we could to weave in the fabric of UMass um, as it is built currently into this evolving fabric for the Columbia Point as a whole. Now, one of the ideas our landscape architects V2 studio had was to build kind of a front yard to UMass 
that's more um, naturalistic um, as opposed to being relying so much on heavier infrastructure. And here we can see the, in, the floating architecture tethered to the landforms. And here's an image of uh, the canal um, as we're zooming in and seeing in the distance, you can see the, the, the end of the canal, the south side of the canal where the tidal um, and, uh, turbines are. Um, and also the gateway across. And then the areas on either side of the canal, which can be used to contain and collect uh, excess water during high water events. In this case, we're looking at the, um, the floating architecture. So we're seeing how it's tethered and anchored to these landforms, these kind of hybrid buildings, which are part landscape and part building. And this last image shows the north side of the canal and the public parks and recreational spaces that are created along the edge of the, of the canal itself. So it's a, a way in which infrastructure can be celebrated, but can also generate energy and potentially revenue in the future. Best of all, as this map in this final study shows of this particular project, it illustrates how most of Columbia Point can stay dry in 100 years. But this won't happen without considerable investment of design and other resources. And again, we had a very large and capable team helping us on this project with too many names to mention and do justice to right at this time. Now, this last project is more modest in scale, and this is back in Boston, but it's meant to be prototypical and scalable and, to, and demonstrate how net zero energy living can be achieved. And in fact, we're working on this new, with this new organization of places on prototypes for bigger developments of four to eight plus units that integrate some of these concepts, but in different form. Um, and after, what I'm gonna do now is share with you uh, some more technical aspects of this particular project and end with a video that was done as part of um, the Boston Home Magazine's uh, feature on free homes of the future in this last issue of Boston Home Magazine. So I would encourage you to take a look at that if you're interested. But this is the house in Harvard, Massachusetts. And these are our clients, um, Pat DeLue and Richard Jensen. They're both former academics. They retired recently. And the program for the house was very compact along the lines of Sarah Susanka's not so big house thinking. And the, the area was a, just a little bit over 2000 square feet. And the project, like most of our projects, evolves through a three-dimensional process from inception throughout the design process. It's located in Harvard, Massachusetts on a 2.5 acre site. And this house had to manage some really challenging site conditions and constraints. These included uh, dealing with setback requirements and finding suitable access to a buildable part of the site. The site had a tremendous amount of ledge. Now the location of the house also had to be carefully balanced with potential locations for water sourcing. So there's a well on site and also the septic. And there's only certain places those could go in certain places or certain requirements for setbacks uh, and perimeters that required of each of those systems. Now working with Derek Brain of SoulWorks, we were able to uh, locate the best place for the house um, and using the solar pathfinder. And it's of course trying to maximize location for solar panels on the roof. This also had to take into account changes in elevation in the shadows cast by trees. In the end, we located the house on one of the higher points of the site. The design of the roof and the panels became a major driver for the design of this house. This also had to be balanced with the design of the interior space and its volume. That is, the goal was to try to get the house and the volume to be the right size. Obviously, this is for efficiency purposes and heating and cooling considerations, but also cost. And of course, we had to think about roof overhangs, trying to shield and uh, shade spaces in the summer as much as possible. It also became a creative opportunity and a, a, a very powerful form of expression, as you'll see in the development of the roof profile. Now, as you can see from this plan, uh, the house is very compact yet very spacious, thanks to being able to borrow spaces and views from adjacent spaces and landscapes. We also try to create an, a building envelope that was as tight as possible. In this case, the walls are about 12 inches thick. 
And we also use triple glaze Pella windows, which I think are a great value for their performance. A window location is a very important consideration in making sure we minimize the amount of windows on the north side while maximizing the windows on the south side is part of the design process and part of modeling the design as the design was evolving and developing. I have to confess, we did use some steel, um, partly for, because it helped us in our mind to reduce the volume of the building. It was more efficient, saved material in that way, but we also just loved the look of it. And the, the uh, general contractor, George and Keith Donahue, brought a wonderful sense of craft to making this um, house possible and really making it as tight as possible. Uh, Derek uh, of SolWorks did all the design work for the solar panels and the solar system. We ended up using 56 panels by LG. We also had two batteries um, which were used as backup um, and they are developed by and manufactured by Zonen, which is a German solar company. Matt Bean of Norian and Siani designed the MEP systems. Um, we only needed three mini splits for the house. And of course, there's also an ERV. And there's other systems that supplement the performance of the house. So those include, for instance, a, a stove, which is only really needed on one or two days of the year. Otherwise, the house is very comfortable. And it's more just about having that little extra comfort. Um, there's also a, what's called a badass fan, excuse my French. Um, uh, that helps circulate air during the summer and also sometimes in the winter where you're trying to bring the hot air down um, and uh, uh, other materials and uses. Now the house also supports the owner's mobility needs. Uh, the, the clients had a Chevy Bolt, which is an electric vehicle, and the car drives just under 12,000 miles a year and uses about 3,500 3, kilowatts per year. Um, the sun powers not only the house, but also the car. And this is really quite remarkable. Um, for those of you who care about this sort of thing, the house has a HERS rating of um, minus 23. So standard home is 100, energy it star is in, um, 85. Net zero would be zero, we're net positive. So we're minus 23. And during the first year of occupancy, the client, a math professor, took a lot of pride in documenting the, heat, uh, the energy consumption and energy generation of the system. And what they discovered is that we generated uh, as much energy within 388 kilowatt hours per year of all the energy required to power the house and the car. Um, and second year, the same result has resulted, uh, has been played out with slightly different variations on the numbers. So this we think is very promising. Again, we want to thank um, our team and especially all of our consultants and our builders, and of course, the support of our client. You really need a great client to be able to do projects like this. Now with that, we'll see if the technology works here. I'm going to go into a video, a five minute video. So Barbara, this should be going. Oh, there it is, yep. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I've got instructions not to touch anything. Okay, there you go. Welcome to Polygas Architecture Studio. We're absolutely thrilled to be part of Boston Magazine's feature on Homes of the Future. We think that sustainable design is at a tipping point right now. With recent developments and improvements in renewable energy technologies, a better understanding of passive house principles and best practices, along with the drop in price points on a lot of these ideas and technologies, we're in a position where it's no longer a question of whether or not we should build buildings as a net zero building, but the question is, why not? Today, I'd love to share with you a story of a unique project for a retired academic couple. Meet Pat Delu, a former vice provost, and Richard Jensen, a math professor. They asked this very question, why not? They had a dream of building a more resilient net zero energy home that was the right size on a bucolic site in Harvard, Mass. Not only is the house net zero energy, that is, it has a HERS rating of minus 23, 
but there is enough renewable energy produced to power the electric car for 10,000 miles a year. The house also has two sets of batteries that help with managing energy intermittency. The combination of PV batteries and an electric vehicle is, in our opinion, a game changer. Allow me to explain how the energy delivery matrix works today and how it can change over time. The typical house today gets its energy from the grid and gets supplementary energy either from oil or gas. Now with solar systems or renewable energy systems, your home can rely less on the grid and secondary carbon-based fuels. Plus, your monthly bill is bound to get reduced. This system works even better if we introduce batteries. The batteries store excess energy and renewable energy for use during the evenings and on cloudy days. They also add a layer of resiliency to the house and the energy systems, especially during storms. Plus, the batteries look really cool. Look at the battery by Zonen, a German company that we used. And finally, we can add an electric car to the energy delivery system, such that the energy from the panels and the battery can be distributed to the electric vehicle. Adding batteries and EVs can also help increase the grid's storage capacity. Now, the process for designing a house of this type is like designing a conventional home, with, however, greater involvement with your engineering team early on in the process. Construction processes used in the house focused on creating tight building envelope and making sure that as little energy was lost through the building envelope itself. This requires a great contractor, which we were lucky to have in Donahue and Sons. So what do you have to sacrifice in having a net zero energy house? If anything, we think net zero energy homes can create higher quality environments, as we hope to demonstrate in this abbreviated tour of the house. Now, the house is gently sited on a crest of a hill where the roof captures as much sun as possible. The old farm stone wall acts as a kind of threshold to the house and carport, which is located on the left. The entry to the house is marked by a lower entrance canopy and structure. The roof eaves are generously proportioned to provide summer shade on the south side of the house. The living and dining room have taller ceilings and south-facing views of the lush landscape. A wood stove is only used on sub-zero days. The kitchen and dining room anchor the floor plan in the adjacent spaces. The mechanical room with the inverters and batteries is located above the kitchen. The master bedroom is on the east side of the house, capturing the morning sun and overlooking stone walls and the towering pine trees. The carport provides shelter for the Chevy Bolt, an electric vehicle. It also serves as a kind of entry gateway framing views of the landscape. So in the end, what we find most fulfilling and rewarding is to see that our clients are happy with the project and that it has performed as anticipated. Um, this would not be possible without the, the generous help and support of this project from our clients, uh, Pat Delu and Richard Jensen. And of course, all the help and effort that went into designing and building this from our engineers, our contractors, and our consultants. Thank you. Okay, well, there you have it. Um, I think I'm within the 45 minutes. Hey. Hope everybody is willing to go and give you a big round of applause. Paul, this is wonderful. And I admire the fact that you really make a point of identifying your team members. You, it's impressive that how much time typically do you allocate for this kind of collaboration? It's no longer the, the uh, designer sitting alone and uh, solving everything, you have to have a tremendous amount of interaction with your, uh, with your team members. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, none of these projects are possible without the full engagement of, of team members who care about design, architecture, and sustainability. And so just traditionally, we've been very lucky to have very talented people working with us um, and uh, contributing their ideas. And then you know, we share those with, with our clients and then um, 
we see how the design evolves from there. So it's this kind of this organic process, but it, you know, it's very much in the idea with the idea in mind of, of building a team and building um, engagement in what we think is important work. As a developer, I'll ask the next question. Mm -hmm. How much does that uh, increase the costs of the uh, of the design work? Because there is so much uh, ingenuity that has to be collected, exchanged, and uh, put into place. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, that's you know there. That's a good, really good question. Um, it's a hard one to answer in the sense that it's also uh, you know kind of a personal question in the level of you know, what is one willing to contribute to into the process above and beyond the standard? Because if if we just did everything standard, we would get, it's more likely than not, we would just get a standard building and design. So there's a couple ways of achieving things that work within an economic model. One is thinking about how we manage the office as compactly and efficiently as possible. So we use our resources very as smartly as we can um, but we're also big risk takers and willing to take on, um, you know, strategic risk. So for instance, living with water was a strategic risk. It's a huge investment for a firm like ours to do a competition like that. Um, so it's hard to justify in the short run, but in the long run, it has led us to opportunities, which we probably wouldn't have gotten had we not taken this path. So it's not a linear response, unfortunately, not that something could be quantified in an Excel sheet. So uh, that's what I'm telling my uh, business advisors and the clients. <laughs> Other questions, Esther? Do you uh, did you get field anything? I early on I saw one question regarding uh, the construction um, go uh, occurred at China that um, um, it was asking about the uh, I um, I have a technical glitch I got lack off um, of the uh, the presentation but um, I think that was um... I can read it oh great um, yeah. okay at the bottom of the concrete moisture creating rusty appearance how is that taken care of oh so that's a good question. So if you look at the, uh, the image, what happens is I understand it, and I'm not an expert on this, and this was explained to us when we were on the site, is that the lower panels had been poured previously, the lower part of the form, and that was clean. The upper ones, the forms had just been taken off. So I think it was a residue from the formwork and the panels. So there's another story to, the, to that form because you know it's a very complex form. And we designed it in Rhino. So what our uh, clients asked us to do in their contractors is to send them 50 cross sections of the building and of the structure from lateral and, and in, in longitudinal section and in plan so they could build the formwork. And I was amazed how close it came. Now, the, what the clients ultimately did, the new clients, is they, they parged or they put a surface over the over the, over the original concrete, which is kind of, it was painful to see that happen, but unfortunately that, that was a result of the change in ownership. Okay. Um, and I, along that front, I actually um, was wondering about how the collaborations occurred. Could you tell us more about how as a, a design, I'm assuming that um, you were in the design hat um, and how does construction actually going on? How does that process work in, in terms of communications? You mean uh, consulting with our Chinese partners? Yes. Yeah, so again, that's why we were so lucky to have partners um, uh, on our team. Uh, so Jue Zan, she was uh, shuttling back and forth between San Francisco, Boston, and, uh, and China, and spending you know, months at a time in China, working with our local partners there. Um, and so when questions came, she could immediately respond, or if there was things that she couldn't respond to immediately herself, she would pass it on to us, and then we would go back and forth. Um, so, and also the other thing we did is we, the drawings that we do, typically you're only supposed to go to design development before you pass on the drawings to a local design institute. 
we took our drawings to much higher level. We took them almost to construction drawing level. Um, so the modifications that had to be made were more minor. And those designs, as we were developing them, we were sharing the designs with our partners in China. Now, not all projects went as well as that. There's others where, you know, basically you turn it over to the LDI and who knows what's going to happen? You know, it, it, so many things can change. You, do you set up the entire team right from the beginning or do you add team members as you uh, discover additional questions and, and obstacles? So um, in terms of the office, the, the volume of work we had was pretty significant. So we had, we typically have a core team and then we bring on people per project um, based on you know, the need. So it, it might be some, it, if it's in the summer, it could be a recent graduate or somebody who's taking an internship year or somebody who's from overseas is coming for years. So there's many different ways in which we bring on uh, people who are with us for let's say three months to a year or two. But then there's the core team members who are always there. Um, and then in addition, um, consultants are brought on uh, as a need basis, but we bring them on early on when there's usually consultants we've worked with in the past that continue to work with us. Oh, it's most impressive. Well, thank can you. I, can I ask a question too? It's very impressive. I really love these projects and the thoughtfulness and well, thank you. collaboration. Well, one question I have about your house in yeah. Harvard. Uh, did you use any other passive strategies for cooling other than overhangs? Well, um, I mean, natural ventilation, I would say. So in the sense that, you know, we located the windows, um, you know, we had windows up high on the north side and operable windows on the south side. So we, yes, we did take those kinds of issues into consideration as much as we could in the cross section uh, I think really worked well. The stair was a key part of it yeah. um, because we have, it's a, kind of centrally located and it's organized so that all the air can come in through there. And there's also in between spaces that help cool it. So for instance, on the north side, there's also a, um, a screened in porch, which uh, brings in kind of cool air from, from the screened in port side into the center of the house. Huh. So. But what we're doing in the, our future projects are we're actually going to be doing more passive houses strategies um, because they're really at a great point and can be integrated uh, pretty seamlessly. So that's we're looking forward to that. Well, I was I, I'm sorry, you know, I have Peter and yep. um, Esther and others. I, I have another appointment I have to go to, but I'm sorry it's so short and we don't have more time to talk. Peter. We'll talk some more, but you know, maybe um, we can continue this conversation another time. Thank you very much, Paul. I really appreciate uh, giving us your insights. Good luck with your next interview. Okay, all right. great. All uh, right. Let's, uh, let's everybody. Uh, yeah, let's all stay on here. Maybe uh, exchange some more ideas. I wanted to mention that uh, okay. Francisca. Sorry, Paul. Yeah, I'm going to take off. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Francisca is a specialist in uh, passive house uh, designs. So maybe you want to go and add a little bit more to your question of, uh, to Paul about uh, uh, natural ventilation or cooling. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I've, uh, there are a few houses uh, by, um, uh, let's see. Uh, Oh, I can't remember his name right now, but anyhow, um, he uses chimneys, you know, that uh, are oversized chimneys as a way to give more uh, a difference in height so that the, the air, the chimney effect is much stronger. Uh, and as a result, the cooling can happen without mechanical equipment. So basically it's, it, but it is drawing air up into a chimney. Right, well, by nat, you know, natural chimney. Yeah, yeah. This is the, the converse of some of the um, 
the Central Asian uh, uh, heat right. catchers or wind catchers, yeah. where they simply bring, uh, catch wind and bring it down into a building. So here are two ways of thinking about it. And uh, uh, that's it's worthwhile considering these natural systems. Right. Great. Anybody else have questions? Tina. Tina, if you want to talk, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, she just appeared that didn't didn't have anything. All right, anybody else? I think we're down to a very uh, low number by now. Jeff? Well, he knows how to unmute himself. <laughs> BD Nyack. Well. I have actually another question. Yeah. I, I wasn't quite following why the thin plates that he had in, that Paul had in one of his high rises would help with the, the temperature. Do you, did you understand? No, I, I, I didn't. I think this would have to be explored in uh, some depth. Uh, I, I thought the uh, explorations of a form of very large buildings uh, based on cooling, cooling with wind was very interesting. And I've seen similar studies about daylighting uh, and shading large buildings. And I, uh, I think that's a, a frontier of uh, inspiring the form or helping to determine the form of these super tall towers by looking at the environmental, these particular environmental concerns, wind and light, they mm -hmm. seem to uh, affect the form in dramatic ways. And, and I think very interesting ways. They, they have sort of sculptural shapes when you're, when you're all done and not uh, and there's, so there's something that's determining the form more than, you know, uh, real estate calculations. Yeah. <laughs> you have to have enlightened clients. First of all, you have to have themes uh, that are um, corralled by somebody like Paul, but every one of you can go and start doing that. Tr the trouble is, Riding herds on all those cats is, is tough. And that's yes. why my, uh, my question was, uh, the, the, the typical person cannot afford that. The typical sing, single pr uh, practitioner or a small firm cannot afford that. So the question is, can you scale up from, or scale back down from the big firm which has the heft and the financial resources to have a, a large number of consultants to the sole practitioner. Francisca, how do you handle that? Question? <laughs> Losing money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're one of these uh, architectures, architects who are privately endowed and the <laughs> <laughs> this is really, it's, it's a pun and I, I don't mean to be too, uh, uh, too ridiculous about it, but it's, it's a tough question for sole practitioners. Yeah, and, and I always feel, um, you know, I can't really charge much more yeah. to, uh, than regular uh, design fees. But of course, uh, you know, at the, uh, you build knowledge and so things get easier, but. Have you thought about becoming an architect developer? Uh, <laughs> that, that's yeah, the I don't back, background into a financial background to do that. There isn't really that much to it. Uh, <laughs> 
I may have to talk with you sometime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can. I, I gave a, a seminar uh, um, with, oh God, I forget his name, at, uh, at the AI convention. One of the AI conventions is how uh, to uh, have architects benefit from their knowledge and their, uh, their ingenuity. And the, the short answer is simply find a project with potential and get an option to purchase this, this project. That doesn't take a great deal of money. And then you find a developer who wants to go and buy that project, but you have a seat at the table. Now that's not foolproof because people and partners can get, uh, get sidetracked and uh, removed from these early uh, uh, partnerships. But at least you start out uh, in having a, a chair at the table and determining how the project is run and how this, the uh, benefits are distributed. So it, it can work because that's how many developers start out. They find a project, they get, uh, perhaps even get permits to develop the project, they uh, make a proposal, they go through the zoning and the planning uh, permitting process. And then with that in hand, there are many developers who will jump in at that point because they don't have to spend the uh, upfront time, but the architect gets compensated or the architect or the planner or whoever puts it together like that can be compensated right from the beginning. Yeah, any, uh, we could go and have a conversation or I could go and give a brief rundown like this if uh, there are enough people interested so that one of these sessions to go and do what, what I did at the AI convention. Yeah. Can you do that with a, a focus on sustainability? I haven't got enough experience, okay, but I can probably find people like Francisca to go and uh, a, 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 and become a, a co-presenter because the issues are uh, um, they are there are design issues, and that means uh, figuring out how to design uh, sustainably. And there are pragmatic financial issues, how to uh, put the team together and uh, as, as an architect developer. So there, uh, there are, the two have to be coordinated just like uh, the, the most complex uh, urban design project. I was impressed by his uh, proposal for um, Columbia Point. Yeah. That's that's some idea that has been floating around for a long time by yeah. people, but uh, he uh, he and his team went much further in in actually quantifying what it might take, and again it it requires a mindset. Somebody who says, "Hey, I can use pragmatic ideas which we already know about, but incorporate them into an innovative design." Now, don't, let's not ask uh, the, the, the tough questions here. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to make uh, Francisca laugh. The tough questions of ecological changes and opposition to what, uh, what that implies for the, uh, the, the ecology of, of the harbor, et cetera, et cetera. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, Francisca and I and uh, Vern Woodworth proposed a 14 mile long dike uh, between Swampscott and Cohasset, which would protect all of uh, the low lying areas of the estuary, the Boston estuary. And that's a topic, by the way, I'm gonna give a uh, brief um, uh, presentation of this uh, to a class at the NEC. There's a guy who asked me to do this in the past and they asked me again. And uh, if anybody's interested, you can email me and I'll get you on that mailing list uh, when, when this occurs. And uh, it, this was 
a very creative idea by Peter. <laughs> we worked, we, we, that was a collaboration. Again, yeah, one idea, and then you have to go and build on that and find a, and document what it would, uh, how much, uh, uh, how many assets, uh, municipal assets and others it would, uh, it, it would protect. And my, my presentation is going to be a twofold presentation. One of them is, okay, if when these current half-hearted measures of a little bit of a 14-foot uh, high wall around uh, the around South Boston or so on uh, fail, uh, sooner or later, all of Metro Boston will be fragmented, and the, uh, all the municipalities and all the people in here, both business and otherwise, are going to have to move. Where to? Right? That's a that's an entire realm of questions, and the second one is okay. Alternatively, figure out whether it's worth thirty to eighty billion dollars to build a dike of this sort and uh, do it so that it doesn't get washed away by the next hurricane, and uh, you you can protect uh, the Metro uh, Boston economic engine by creating something like that. So this is. I think it really depends on how long term your planning is. Yeah. The Boston has all, all these plans, but they're kind of puny when you think about the long term. It will, it's wasted money. That's right. They are just wasting money. There, there is no easy answer to that because people uh, uh, in government, uh, and this is this the, the, such a project has to be a publicly funded project. We, uh, we tried to figure out whether we could get a large portion of it to be paid by private developers of that uh, maybe uh, 20 foot wide, or I don't know, maybe it was 200 foot wide top of the dike. Um, it, you can't make it work financially. Okay, I think unless anybody has any other questions, how do we get a continuing education credit? <laughs> ah, good. Esther, you're on board. <laughs> Hello, yeah, yes, um, yes, sorry, uh, my bad. So please, um, there is, um, 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 I will, uh, a message that put in by Susan um, on the group chat. Um, if you click into the link, you could um, log on into that particular link and then type in your information and your um, AIA numbers. And that way Susan will have a process and send you the um, continue education credits. I'm, I'm not seeing it on the That's chat. The Go look in the chat, but at the very top. Uh, Find it, Jeff? It's BSA to everyone. All right. Let me... It's there twice, actually. Just scroll up to the top. Yeah, it's not scrolling. <laughs> well, do you want me to send it to you? That would be great. Okay, I'm going to go and just copy and paste this into an email and send it to you right now. All right? Okay, I'm sorry. It just uh, no I'm having technical difficulties here. I see chat questions from E.D. Okay. Nayak, Rana Goddess, so on, but I don't see a credit. Um, there. Um, I'll do it right now. Um, uh, actually, I don't. I may have to go and reduce the screen. Yes, I can. Um, I, um, I can, I'll get it to you, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Okay. CE credits. I am doing nothing more than 
pasting it in and and signing it off with my uh, with my signature. Okay, it's on its way right now. Great, thank you. Like the check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we can call it a day. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and thank let's uh, for the until the next time. Looking Thank forward you. to it. Good. Take care, all. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Esther. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all.